All right. Well, here, let's get started. Um, you remember when we left off last week before the holiday, right? Um, I, we were talking about the Ising model uh, with interactions between neighboring spins. Right? And I showed you how to work out mean field theory to be an approximate description for the free energy. And then um, I showed you this um, Mathematica um, interactive uh, plot to um, see what that free energy looks like as a function of the magnetic order parameter. And at the end of the class, we got to a plot like this one, where um, we could see what happens uh, to the free energy as a function of the magnetic or order parameter, right, as we vary this combined parameter, which is the interaction strength divided by Boltzmann's constant times temperature. All right, so if I increase that parameter gradually, it's like reducing temperature in the lab, so the denominator is getting bigger. Okay, and you can see uh, as, we, um, as we increase this parameter, the plot gets flatter and flatter, okay, so that it doesn't look so much like a parabola anymore. It looks more like uh, x to the fourth kind of function. Okay, and then it gets extremely flat, and at a certain critical point, the shape of the curve changes. And instead of being a, a parabola going upwards, it changes to this kind of shape where the minimum splits into two minima. Okay, so you can see that there's a min and a max and then a min like that. Um, and so um, this is a pretty radical change in the behavior. Right? It means that instead of uh, having the, the equilibrium state be at m equals zero, the equilibrium state is going to be at some non-zero value of the magnetic order parameter. And that non-zero value might either be this positive number or this negative number. Right? And then as we continue to reduce the temperature, the positions of the minima move outwards towards bigger and bigger values of the magnetic order parameter, closer and closer to one. Okay. So um, let's, let's look at this a little bit more with the whiteboard. Okay, so I'm going to stop the uh, Mathematica sharing and I'll start it again with my whiteboard. Okay, let's see. Click uh, share. Okay, so um, you could see that um, there were two kinds of plots depending on the temperature. Okay. So when we were at um, high temperature, uh, we had a plot for the free energy as a function of M, which looked pretty much like a parabola, sort of like that. Okay. And when we were at a uh, low temperature, the minimum right at m equals zero uh, split up into two minima. So the plot is something like this. And this is meant to be symmetrical. That didn't come out very symmetrical, did it? Let me try again. Something like that. Okay, so um, we we go from having the minimum just there. So this is one minimum, and now there are two 
equal minima there and there. Right. And um, so the um, magnetic order parameter could go to either of those values, either the positive one or the negative one. And it's just going to be random which one it goes to. Okay, so let me tell you uh, a, a few um, vocabulary words to go along with this. Okay. So the, the state where there are two minima with um, uh, non-zero values of M, that is called a ferromagnetic phase. So ferro, like iron, right? This is the kind of behavior in like a permanent magnet, like iron, right? Um, by comparison, this one is called uh, paramagnetic. Um, and um, the, the process of going from the paramagnetic to the ferromagnetic state is called uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. So the word spontaneous means um, the opposite of induced. That is, it is not induced by a field. So there's nothing um, external which is forcing the magnetic order to go one way or the other. Um, instead, um, the system is randomly choosing a direction. Okay, and you could imagine, you know, if you imagine all these little magnetic spins like people, right, and they all want to agree with their neighbors, right, and so, you know, everybody says to the neighbors, you know, which way should we align? Which way should we align? And randomly they agree to mostly align up or mostly align down. Um, so um, to, to compare these different states, right, you could say that um, the, the high temperature state is favored by entropy. So you remember, that's a help. You remember that um, uh, entropy is the log of the number of configurations that go into a single macrostate, right? The number of microstates that go into a single macrostate. Okay. Well, when you have um, the uh, uh, m equals zero right here, there are a lot of ways that you can have some of the spins going up and some of the spins going down to give an average of zero or approximately zero, okay? There's a huge number there, okay? By comparison, these states um, have uh, a non-zero value of the magnetic order, and there are fewer possible configurations with either of those non-zero values. Okay? So entropy prefers this high temperature M equals zero state. Okay? By com comparison, um, energy favors the state over here, right? Because energy, it, the energy of interaction is proportional to a negative m squared, right? And so it's the lowest energy when m is, when m squared is big. So m should be big, positive or negative. So here I'll mark this is favored by uh, energy, okay? 
For another point of comparison, we could say that the um, high temperature state um, is a symmetric state because there's no difference between the up direction and the down direction, right? Half of the spins are pointing up, half the spins are pointing down. So up and down are just the same in that phase. By comparison, in this uh, low temperature state, we're randomly choosing one of these states and not the other. So that there will be, let's say we choose, for example, this one. Then there will be a lot of spins pointing up and not so many pointing down. So after the transition, there will be less symmetry. Okay. So I could mark these things, do another color. I'll mark these things in orange, okay? So this is higher symmetry and this is lower symmetry. Okay, now um, another uh, word that might go along with this transition is the word order. Okay. So when we go to the low temperature state, okay, um, the system has picked one of the directions for the, um, the spins to point, okay? And the spins are mostly aligning in that direction, okay? So um, that means you know, there's, there's a favorable kind of alignment, right? That you don't have necessarily 100% of the spins in that direction, but most of the spins are in that direction. And um, that is uh, described by the word order, okay? So we would say this has more order and this thing has less order. Um, now, um, when you look at the, the words order and symmetry here, okay, this is a point that um, students sometimes get confused about, okay, because um, students uh, sometimes have the point of view based on sort of morality that um, order is good and symmetry is good. Therefore, order and symmetry must be the same thing. Okay, don't, don't think that way, okay? Don't think that way, because this is not a question of morality. This is a question of physics, okay? And um, in this uh, physics sense of the word, order means the opposite of symmetry. Order means lack of symmetry, okay? Because symmetry means different things being the same. So in this case, up and down being the same. Okay? And order means different things being different, right? So to have most of the spins pointing in one direction and not in the other direction. Okay. Um, all right. Now, the, um, the, the change from um, one of these states to the other one, um, this, it, it's called a spontaneous symmetry breaking, or we could say it is called a phase transition. And it occurs at a critical point, or we might say at a critical temperature. Okay? So there is um, a specific 
temperature where the transition happens, okay? And that temperature is called uh, T sub C, TC, um, C for critical, okay? Um, now, um, what, suppose we want to figure out what is this critical temperature, okay? One way to do that would be to look at the, the graphs, right? So you remember I was playing around with the graphs and I was adjusting this parameter for um, uh, JQ divided by KT. Um, and um, I, I, I could just see, you know, when I tune that parameter at a certain value, this one minimum splits into two minimum. That's one way to do it numerically, but suppose we wanted to do the calculation more algebraically, right? So to get an algebraic expression for um, when we have uh, one minimum or two minimum. Okay. So if we wanted to do that, okay, one good way to do it would be to um, make a mathematical criterion for what's happening right around there, right at um, the m equals zero point. Okay. So what you can see um, at the m equals zero point, right, in both cases, the first derivative of the free energy with respect to m is zero, right? You know that the first derivative is zero at a minimum or at a maximum. But what about the second derivative, right? Here, at this point, the second derivative of f with respect to m is positive, right? the minimum. Okay. Over here, the second derivative of f with respect to m is negative. Um, Right at the transition, you remember we had a plot that looks like this, okay? So um, F versus M was really flat, like uh, a fourth order polynomial that's plotted, okay? Right there, the second derivative is equal to zero. Right. which you know, because you know how to calculate the second derivative of a fourth order function, and it's, it's zero, right, at, uh, at, at uh, x equals zero. Okay. Um, so if we want to know what's the critical temperature, we can figure that out by uh, calculating the second derivative of f with respect to m uh, at m equals zero and um, setting that equal to zero. Okay, so let's do it. Okay. So um, you remember we have this expression, you know, f as a function of m is negative a half uh, jq uh, m squared um, plus uh, K, T, and then this combination of the logs. One plus M over two, log one plus M over two, uh, plus one minus M over two, log one minus M over two. Okay. So the first derivative is uh, minus, uh, whoops, no, not a half. Sorry about that. Where's undo? Minus J Q M plus K T. And now one half, let's see. So it's the 
I've got to use the product rule, right? The, the first times the derivative of the second. Okay, so uh, one half, one over plus m. Um, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this at all? I should have just made you do it for homework. Okay, let me try this again. Okay, it's, 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 it's the first thing times the derivative of the second. Okay, one plus m over two times the derivative of the second, one over one plus m. All right, now plus the derivative of the first thing times the second. That's what I meant to do, right? I think that's what I meant to do. Okay, so uh, that's the first part. Okay, now it is plus the second thing, one minus m over two times the derivative of the second. So minus one over one minus m. Okay, and then uh, minus a half walk, one minus m over two. Okay, any blunders yet? No, all right, I'm still working on it then. Okay, so we can cancel the one plus m's and the one minus m's, and then this is a half and this is minus a half. Cancel that. So this is minus jqm plus kt uh, times a half log one plus m over two minus log one minus m over two. Like that, right? Okay. So that's the first derivative. The second derivative d2f dm squared minus jq plus kt over 2 uh, and then what? It's uh, the derivative of this guy is 1 over 1 plus m and the derivative of this guy is minus and minus m like that. Okay, that's the second derivative. Now remember, we don't want the second derivative just any old place, anywhere along the plot. We want the second derivative here at m equals zero. The same thing there. The second derivative at m equals zero. So the second derivative, whoops, wrong pen. The second derivative evaluated at m equals zero is minus jq plus kt over two and this is uh, one plus one so it's minus jq plus kt i have a question please um, with the previous line, it may just it may just been a while because I didn't do a hand or a derivative by hand over summer, but the derivative of the natural log is one over the the inside, right? So yes. where is the two then? When you take that from line from the the middle line from log of one plus m over two, when you take that derivative, it turns into one over two plus m. What happens to the two? Or am I just am I just losing my head a little bit? Um, you're, you're losing your head a little bit. Um, okay. So uh, option number one, right, choice number one, which you can perfectly well do, and I was sort of doing in my head, but I could do it more explicitly, is to say the log of one plus m. I know what you're going to do right now. You the split log it up. Of one plus m yeah. minus the log of two. Right, and then the derivative of log two is zero because it's a constant, okay? Um, that's one way to do it. The, the other way to do it um, is, um, the other way to do it is to, with the chain rule that you could have a, 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 a one over 
one plus m over two, and then with the chain rule, you get a half in the numerator. And, and it works the same way either way, right? And um, I didn't do any hand derivatives over the summer either, but I did a whole bunch in the summer of 1979. So um, I sort of remember it from then, barely. Uh, My okay. bad. Thank you. Right, 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 right. Um, okay, so um, either way, either way, we get to this answer. Okay, so if we want to know at what value is the second derivative at m equals zero equal to zero, that is our phase transition. Okay, so the transition is at kt equals jq. Okay, so that means t equals jq over Boltzmann's constant. Okay, so this then is our, our prediction for tc. Um, and we can see, well, what does the prediction depend on? Okay, the main thing it depends on is this uh, J parameter, okay? And J, what is J, right? Well, you remember J is the strength of the interaction between one spin and its nearest neighbors, right? How strongly does a spin um, tend to align with its neighbors? Right. What's the difference in energy be ha between having the favorable alignment versus the unfavorable alignment? Okay. And so um, if that interaction strength is strong, then the phase transition happens at a high temperature. That is, even up to a high temperature, the, um, the, the spins tend to align with their neighbors. Right? On the other hand, if that interaction strength is weak, then the phase transition happens at a low temperature. So that means you need to cool the system really cold, really close to absolute zero before you'll get the alignment between the neighboring spins. Okay. So that's one uh, important thing that the prediction depends on. Um, you can also see that it depends on Q. Okay, you remember Q is the coordination number. That is to say, how many neighbors does a spin have? Okay. And so um, this is telling us that if spins have lots of neighbors, then the tendency to align with the neighbors is, is pretty strong, right? Um, and um, so that depends in part on uh, the dimensionality, right? If you have three dimensions compared to two dimensions, okay? There'll be more neighbors in general in 3D than in 2D, because in 3D, you can have neighbors north, south, east, west, up and down, right? Whereas in 2D, it's just, north, south, east, west. Uh, and so um, that means that the, the uh, transition temperature is likely to be higher in 3D than it is in 2D. Um, and um, yeah, so that's a, a, a general kind of principle, right? that it's easier to have an ordered phase, like a ferromagnet, in higher dimensions. Uh -huh. Question. Uh, I mean, so here we are talking about transition temperature, and uh, this transition temperature is uh, same as Curie temperature or different? Uh, say it again, please. I didn't quite follow. Okay. Uh, in uh, solid state mechanics, we talk about the Curie transition temperature in a ferromagnetism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the Curie temperature. Uh -huh. yes, and it, it is also same like Curie temperature or different one? This is the same as the Curie temperature. But uh, in uh, statistical mechanics, uh, we consider atom as a, atom as a uh, 
um, magnet and we consider about the orientation of uh, magnet atomic ma atomic magnet and we do not talk about the spin in case of uh, uh, ferromagnetism of metals or uh, gases but here we are talking about the spin so these two concepts are different or same these concepts are the same um so so uh, this is um you know a, a, a way of saying what's the magnetic phase transition um uh, so uh in 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 tc um uh, i mean you're you're pointing out we could also say the c stands for curie right this is the the yeah. curie temperature this was um work by the same Pierre Curie, uh, something he did in addition to the work about radioactivity. Um, and um, so, so this is, um, this is a, a, a model for the magnetic phase transition where there are only two possibilities of spin up versus spin down. Okay, so I think what you're asking about is that there can be other models for magnetism where the spins don't have to just have those two possibilities, yes, but yes. they could point anywhere in three dimensions. Yes, and um, yes, there, there are um, improved models for magnetism that have uh, all possible orientations in three dimensions, not just up or down. And um, I'm not going to be talking about that in this course, but, but yes, that is one way that you could improve this model. Um, and, um, but, but the physical principle is still very similar. And um, people would also use mean field theory to, um, to solve that improved model, right? And there would be uh, a related kind of prediction for the phase transition in mean field theory there. Thank you. Okay, good. So now um, here we have a prediction for what is the temperature associated with this transition. Right? But that's not the only interesting thing that we would want to predict. Okay, so what else could we predict, right? Well, an another thing that we might care about is um, in the ferromagnetic phase, how big is the magnetic order parameter? Right? So we know it's not zero. It can be positive or negative, but how big is it? Okay? That would be an another good thing to try to calculate. Okay? So let's try to calculate it. Okay? So uh, if we, we can say, you know, the question is, um, uh, let's see, to calculate M in the ferromagnetic phase. And see how it depends on temperature. Okay. So um, what do we know about M, right? Well, we, we know that um, it's a minimum of the free energy as a function of M, right? So um, it, it's a minimum. So a minimum is a place where the first derivative is equal to zero, okay? Well, luckily we already calculated the first derivative. So we wanna solve for when it's equal to zero. Okay, so let's calculate that, right? We wanna calculate where is DF dm equal to zero. Well, let's see, it's kind of hard to copy from one page to another in this, in this app. That's a downside. Okay, so negative jqm, right, and then plus kt over two, and then what? That's uh, log one plus m over two minus log of one minus m over two uh, 
is equal to zero. Okay. So um, I want to calculate this. Unfortunately, this is not the sort of thing that has an exact solution. Okay. And um, that's, uh, that's life. Um, I mean, in, in physics, we often have to deal with things that don't have exact solutions. And so we have to make um, approximations for them. Um, so let's see, how can we make an approximation for this? Okay. Well, for one thing, uh, let's, let's cancel the, the log twos, all right? So minus JQM plus uh, KT over two. Um, what is this? This is a um, log one plus M minus log two minus log one minus m plus log two equals zero. Ah, we get rid of those guys. Good. Okay. Now, um, how can we solve this thing? Okay. Um, if we want to solve this thing, we need to say, well, what's a reasonable approximation to go in here? I can't solve for the behavior for any value of the temperature or any value of the M, but I can make an approximation that works when we're pretty close to the phase transition so that M is pretty close to zero. So near the transition, we know that M is near zero. It's not very far away, okay? Farther from the transition, M is gonna be farther from zero. We'll have a plot like that one, okay? And then things will be harder to calculate, okay? But let's make an assumption that M is much less than one, that the absolute value of M is much less than one, okay? So that M is really close to zero. Okay? In that situation, we can make an approximation to a function like log of one plus m or log of one minus m, okay? And um, what we want to do is to approximate the function by its Taylor series. Okay, so do you guys remember what Taylor series are? I see some favorable looks, some, um, uh, some not. Let me give you a refresher about Taylor series, okay? So Taylor series is a very general approach about uh, how to make approximations to functions, okay? Um, I remember when I first took my first calculus course and the teacher told me, oh, you gotta pay attention to this Taylor series stuff because that's the basis of all approximations. And I thought, ha, I'm never gonna need that. I'll just do everything exactly in my life. Ha, that's gotta be the stupidest thought that ever went through my head. Um, um, now I've never done anything exactly in the last 20 years. Um, so uh, I, I, I use these things every day and um, Mostly, I get Mathematica to calculate them, but once a year, just to show some students, I'll, I'll, I'll do one by hand, okay? So, this is your lucky day. I get to do one by hand. All right, so, suppose we have a function, okay? 
f of x. Okay, and we know the function at some particular value, like at x zero. Okay, and suppose that x is close to x zero. And so then we want an approximation for f of x. Okay. So the way that we do it in a Taylor series is we say, well, f of x is, well, it's pretty close to f of x zero. So our, our first, our, our zeroth approximation, count this as the zeroth order approximation is you could say, what's f of x? I don't know, maybe it's pretty close to f of x zero. That's the lowest thing, that's the zero order. okay? Now, how about an improvement, okay? Well, the next improvement is we would say it is um, the first derivative f prime at x zero times the difference x minus x zero. This combination, those two terms, these things would be called the first order approximation. Okay, that's better than the zeroth order. Okay, what if we want an improvement on that? Well, we could say now it'll be plus one half f double prime, the second derivative at x zero times x minus x zero squared. Um, that's the second order approximations to include all of those things. Okay. Uh, what about the next level? Well, then we'd say plus one over three factorial f triple prime at x zero times x minus x zero cubed. That's the third order. The fourth order is one over four factorial f quadruple prime, the fourth derivative of x zero times x minus x zero to the fourth power plus dot dot dot, right? You can keep doing this and keep getting better and better approximations, okay? And this works if the quantity x minus x zero is small. Okay? So that means, right, if x is close to x zero, then x minus x zero has to be small. Okay? And then these powers are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, here's x minus x zero to the first power the second power, the third power, the fourth power. Right? If x minus x zero is small, those powers keep getting smaller and smaller and the series works better and better. If x minus x zero is big, then this whole thing is a disaster and you wouldn't want to do it. Okay. Because then you know, the, the high order terms, the dot dot dots, would be getting bigger and bigger, and you really don't have any idea what the function is. Okay. Let's apply that now to this thing that we care about, okay? This log function. 
So suppose f of x is the log of 1 plus x. Okay. And um, x0 is uh, just equal to 0. So f at x0, let me put it over here, f at x0 is equal to the log of 1 plus 0. So that's the log of 1, which is 0. OK, so we know what the function is at x equals 0. The function is just equal to 0 there. OK, now, now um, let's uh, go to the, the first uh, derivative, OK? So f prime of x is 1 over 1 plus x. So f prime at x 0 is 1 over 1 plus 0. That's 1. So what about f double prime of x? That is um, 1 over 1 plus x squared. Right. So f double prime at x 0 is uh, also equal to 1. Okay. What about f triple prime of x? OK. Did I by any chance forget a minus sign here? Ha ha ha, I did. Sorry about that. OK. What about f triple prime of x? OK, so that will be uh, 2 over 1 plus x cubed. So f triple prime at x 0 is equal to 2. So this tells us then that f of x, the log of 1 plus x, is approximately equal to x minus x minus 1 half x squared. OK, so that's half of the second derivative okay, plus one third x cubed plus dot dot dot. OK, and um, similarly, the log of one minus x is approximately, if I just put in negative x here, negative x minus a half x squared minus one third x cubed plus dot, dot, dot. OK, I hope I got that right. I have the final answer in my notes, but I don't have all the steps. OK, I sure hope that's right. OK, so now let's see if it works. OK, so I want to go back to my expression for this first derivative of the free energy. Okay. And I'm going to put in this um, approximation for the logs in the second term. Okay. So um, that means minus JQM plus KT. Uh, I need the log of 1 plus M the log of 1 plus m, OK? So that is, um, that's this stuff, right, with m in place of x, OK? So x minus a half x squared plus m minus a half m squared plus a third m cubed. 
Okay, and then minus the log of one minus m. Okay. So minus the same stuff with the opposite sign of m. So minus negative m minus a half m squared minus a third m cubed plus dot dot dot. All this equals zero. Okay. Let's see if we can simplify this now. Okay, so minus j q m plus k t. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here there's a factor of m here and another one there. 2m. Okay, now the m squared parts cancel. Okay. Uh, then the m cubed terms add up. So plus two thirds m cubed plus dot dot dot. Things that are small that I can neglect when m is small. Okay. So this means negative j q m plus two k t m plus two thirds k t m cubed plus dot 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 is equal to zero. This looks like a cubic equation. Okay. So let's solve it the way that we would solve a cubic equation. So we can factor out an m. Okay, so we get m times 2kt minus jq m. No, not times m, times 1. Undo. Okay. Plus 2 thirds kt m squared equals zero. So either m equals zero or this other stuff is equal to zero. Okay, so this or two thirds kt m squared is equal to jq minus 2kt, which means then that m squared is equal to jq minus 2kt divided by 2 thirds kt. This solution, the m equals zero solution, that is, way back here, that is the maximum, right? You know that the local maximum is also a place where the first derivative is equal to zero. So that's not the solution that I'm looking for. Okay. I want this one or this one, which means plus or minus a square root. Okay, so that means that m is plus or minus the square root of jq minus 
2 kT over 2 thirds kT. This is telling us that there are two possible solutions. M can be either a positive number or a negative number. And that's the same as what the graph was telling us. Okay, so the good news is um, two solutions. The other good news is that they are functions of temperature. The bad news is um, I made a factor of two mistake somewhere. That's what I get for trying to do algebra just on my own without um, having all the steps written out. I don't have time to find it just now because uh, I'm over time. So I'm going to stop. Good news. You get to find my mistake. Okay. So all of you guys go through this algebra and somewhere I made a mistake. See if you can figure out where it is. And then um, um, you can um, embarrass me by pointing it out in the next class. So I will see you in that next class on um, um, whenever it is, Friday. Okay, thank you all. Bye. Bye. But any questions, of course, by all means, right now. Let's, let's...